Hi, I'm excited to share some research results on artificial intelligence, bias, and autism. Um, but before doing that, I wanted to give a couple examples of how bias might accidentally make its way into artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, the first example is Amazon in 2014. Amazon had developed a artificial intelligence-based resume scanner that would take someone's resume and it would give it a score between one star and five stars. Um, but unfortunately, by 2015, Amazon had actually essentially fired its artificial intelligence scanner. And the reason for this is because the scanner was penalizing any resume that included the word women's. What had happened is that the algorithm was initially trained over a 10 year, uh, based on 10 years of hiring data. And most of the applicants for these tech positions were men. And unfortunately, this means that the algorithm had made the assumption that the best or most preferable group of applicants was men. And so if the resume scanner would see that someone had listed that they were, for example, on the women's chess club or on the women's swimming team, they would, uh, the scanner would downgrade the person's score. And likewise, if the scanner saw that the person had graduated from an all women's college, um, it would potentially downgrade the person's score as well. Um, a second example of AI bias, and one that's going to be a little bit more closely related to the research results I'm going to share in a minute, um, was a sentiment tester algorithm. So this is from a really interesting article on an algorithm called Concept Number Batch. And the author had essentially found a way to um, put in a certain sentence or phrase and generate the sentiment in response. So if you put in a sentence with a really high score, that would mean a more positive sentiment. Um, if you put in a sentence and it gave you a lower score, that would be a more negative sentiment. Um, and what the author found is that if you put in the sentence, let's go get Italian food, it would return a positive sentiment of around two. But if you just replace the word Italian with Mexican, the sentiment would drop from two to um, 0 0.39. So a really significant drop. And the author found that similarly, when um, creating a automate, sort of an automated restaurant reviewer based on this tool, um, any Mexican restaurant was being ranked very um, negatively, even if the actual reviews of the restaurant were extremely positive. And the reason for this is because the tool had learned inappropriate connections between words by studying human generated text. Um, it had essentially found that in a lot of these texts, the word Mexican was associated with the word illegal, and therefore the term or any food or restaurants associated with it was being labeled as bad by the algorithm. Um, so I think this example can highlight how negative associations between words and texts can be picked up by AI algorithms and um, can sometimes have these really inappropriate negative correlations that potentially could then lead into um, negative decisions on the part of the algorithm. So in this case, if this algorithm was actually released and used publicly, um, Mexican restaurants would have been very much suppressed or uh, penalized by the algorithm. So the goal of our project was to look at how these correlations are showing up in terms related to autism or neurodivergence and whether similar um, negative correlations might exist. So the goal of this video is mostly to review some of our research results uh, in very general terms. I'll definitely put the link to the actual article, which has the figures and more numerical data as well. Um, and then towards the end, I also wanted to discuss a common algorithm um, that is separate, but may also disadvantage neurodivergent individuals, and that is personality tests in the hiring process. Um, so to begin with, I'm going to just quickly share my screen. Uh, let's see, here it is. So this is a little bit of a simple image, but 
even though it's just a two-dimensional kind of hypothetical model, it's meant to give an idea of how word embeddings might work. The idea is that an algorithm is going to look at large amounts of human-generated text. So this will often be billions of words. And the algorithm learns which words are frequently connected to each other in text. And at the end, each word is going to be given a position in space. In reality, this is going to be a multidimensional vector space, but I can't visualize that for you. Um, so I just came up with kind of a simple model that's two-dimensional instead. Um, so in this model, we can see that words like person and human are linked closely together. Um, words like disease and sickness are also linked closely together. Um, and in general, words that have a more positive sentiment are kind of clustered together in one region, in this case, the region on the right. And words that have a more negative sentiment are clustered in a different region. Um, and if you add more dimensions, there's also, you know, you can imagine having a broader range of concepts that words can be um, clustered based on. So how can we look for potentially negative correlations between concepts in this algorithm um, or between words related to a specific concept? Um, the gist of the way that we test this is we come up with different batches of words. So in this case, we're looking at um, words related to neurodivergence and words related to being neurotypical. And we want to compare how each batch of words is perceived. Um, so we might, for example, and again, this is just a, a hypothetical figure. Um, we might test the word aut autistic, autism, and ADHD. Then we have our neurotypical word set in blue. And we would want to look at how each word set is linked to um, our, our test sets. So in this case, we want to see whether um, the neurodivergent related terms are more closely related to negative social terms like annoying, unpleasant, and bad than to positive social terms. Um, and we have to compare whether the autistic or neurotypical word set is closer to each group. Um, and so in general, for each bias test, we would do something similar to this. We would come up with a set of negative words, um, a set of positive words for whatever bias we're testing. Um, and then we would compare how the neurodivergent and neurotypical word set um, appear relative to each, uh, each batch in our test. So this one depicted here is good versus bad, but we also generated a lot of other tests as well. Um, for example, we looked at childish versus mature. We were curious whether terms related to neurodivergence might also be associated to terms related to being childish or young, um, potentially reflecting the fact that neurodivergent neurodivergent adults are sometimes still viewed as being a little bit more childish or um, immature. We also looked at words related to danger versus safety. Um, we tested a total of 14 different negative biases. Um, and for each test and each bias um, or potential bias, we looked at this for 11 different encoders. We didn't want to just pick one algorithm and um, you know, assume that all other algorithms would have similar results. Um, instead, we used 11 different algorithms that have been um, utilized during the past several years. So we could have kind of a broader snapshot of how prevalent this was in different encoders. Um, and our results were that, in general, there were quite high levels of bias. So multiple individual tests had scores higher than one point um, 1.5. And that's notable given that the highest possible score one could have is two. So a two is the highest possible level of bias. Um, a negative two on the other hand would be sort of a reverse bias. If we were to have a negative two, that would mean that terms related to being neurotypical had strong negative correlations to them. Um, and we found that the highest levels of bias were for tests related to danger, tests related to being uptight or obsessive, and the highest um, average degree of bias we found was actually test related to slurs. So we took a word set and we filled it with terms that were sort of insults or slurs like idiot, et cetera, um, and then compared it to, and then the other word set was one with positive terms. Um, and we found that the terms related to neurodivergence were 
strongly associated with slurs. Um, perhaps surprisingly, there were, I think out of the 14 tests, there were around two that had quite low um, bias scores. And one of those tests was empathy. And this was interesting because when we were coming up with the tests, I initially assumed that empathy would be an area where there might be the highest degree of bias. I thought that um, terms related to autism or neurodivergence would be associated with being cold or uncaring or otherwise unempathetic. And there really wasn't a strong association there. So that was kind of one bright spot in our analysis. Um, we also wanted to look at tests where, which might be in areas of autistic strengths. Um, for example, honesty, loyalty, or having a accepting or non-judgmental attitude. We were curious to see whether encoders might pick up at least a positive association between autism and these words. But unfortunately, that didn't seem to be the case either. Um, on average, there was even still a mild to moderate negative association with terms related to autism, um, even when testing these areas that we might expect to be strengths. Um, and it is worth noting that when we're com computing these scores, these are an indirect way to approximate how the algorithm might make decisions about autistic or neurodivergent individuals if it were used in a decision-making process. Um, the wheat score does not tell us what the algorithm actually thinks or feels about autistic individuals because that's not possible. We're really only able to tell what links there are between different words, and we aren't able to know exactly how that link got there or um, how it might impact decision-making, but it does provide one potential indication. Um, and finally, we looked at a simple metric for sentences. So we moved from word embedders to sentence embedders, and we try to calculate um, the perceived goodness of these different sentences. So as you might expect, a sentence like I am a person, which is kind of a neutral to positive sentence, would have a higher perceived goodness than a sentence like I am a bank robber. Um, but what we found is that if you take sentences like I have this disability, that disability, et cetera, um, you know, replacing it with the actual name of the dis disability that you're testing, many of these sentences had an even lower perceived goodness than sentences like, I am a bank robber, um, indicating, again, a potential uh, high level of negative associations with neurodivergence and disability more generally. Um, and it is certainly likely to be the case that the presence and degree of bias is going to be changing with time. It also is going to depend on the specific encoders that are being tested. Um, but fortunately, there is something that can be done about biases of this nature, and that has been done for several different biases already. Um, there are techniques used to sort of de-bias um, these types of unwanted correlations. And some of these techniques have already been used to successfully uh, mitigate bias related to gender, race, other aspects of someone's identity. Um, but more broadly, aside from the potential to apply de-biasing techniques to neurodivergence, I think it would be interesting to look at how other AI algorithms um, might hold up when we think about neurodivergence. So for example, if we were to take a resume scanner, would that resume scanner penalize an applicant who mentions autism or disability in their application? For example, being on a um, disability uh, inclusion committee or something of that sort. Um, I really don't know the answer. I think it would be a really interesting project to look at. Um, it would also be interesting to look at how uses of AI in other situations like a medical context, whether um, neurodivergent individuals are served as well by decisions made from the AI as neurotypical individuals. And I think more fundamentally, there's of course an ongoing need for research on societal biases. Um, one other specific area that I wanted to discuss is personality tests in the hiring process. So this is kind of segueing to a completely different topic from our research article. Um, and it's really more inspired by a report I read from the Center for Democracy and Technology. So the report stated that 76% of companies with more than 100 employees use personality tests in hiring. And these tests can have a really broad impact, not only because of how often they're used, but because if one specific algorithm or test is being used by multiple different companies, any potential flaw or bug in the algorithm 
is going to have that much more of an impact. If you think about a person who might make imperfect decisions in one area, they're probably only going to be making decisions within one company. There's not going to be clones of them sent out to make the exact same type of potentially um, unwanted decision in a variety of places. But these algorithms can have a really broad reach. So all the more reason to be especially careful with the development of them. Um, and the way that these tests are developed is they're often first run on existing employees that are considered successful. And well, essentially they're run on all employees and then the um, person's personality data and their the results of their assessment is going to be compared to some sort of metric evaluating the person's success as an employee. And from this, the test might pick out certain features that are perceived to lead to success in employees. So for example, the test might find that high high performing employees are more outgoing. Um, but these tests do have potential to be disadvantageous for autistic people and disabled people more generally. Um, and probably even neurotypical people with certain personality traits. So one way that this could potentially be disadvantageous is um, that the concept of what correlates to an employee's success might be overly generalized. Um, an employer might use this personality test for multiple different job positions, even if the specific traits needed to succeed in a certain job may be different, or even if a trait that such as extroversion, which might be advantageous to some extent in a certain setting, isn't really necessary for the job at all. Um, I think there's also even a broader contact, uh, broader question of how are we defining success of an employee? And is that metric itself um, really focused on the person's ability to do the job? Um, or is it bringing in kind of extra, uh, extra concepts such as whether the person is perceived as, you know, being social at their workplace, um, whether they're perceived as kind of meeting certain social expectations. Um, so there's a lot of areas, I think, of this test that could potentially be looked at to mitigate any bias. Um, one specific aspect of a test that I don't know if this is common in all personality tests, but at least um, appears to happen sometimes is recording um, of someone's response as they're taking the test. So in some cases, applicants will be asked to record their answers so they will verbally answer a question and then that recording will be analyzed to look at their facial expressions, eye contact, vocal enthusiasm, and vocabulary. And my guess is that this kind of process could very well um, end up inadvertently um, minimizing the success of autistic applicants. We know that autistic people definitely on average have differences in eye contact, have differences in facial expressions on average, and may express enthusiasm quite differently. So it seems at least plausible that this tool might disproportionately screen out autistic individuals. Um, and a fact that might compound this further is that the group of successful applicants, uh, successful employees that the tool is modeled on, kind of the ideal outcome is modeled on, is very likely to be predominantly non-autistic individuals, both because non-autistic individuals are just more common in the world and also because autistic individuals are very likely to be unemployed or underemployed. And so um, maybe an even smaller percentage of the workforce. Um, and even among those who are in the workforce, once you take into account that they may not be properly accommodated um, or may have certain barriers at their workplace, um, the individuals who are kind of able to overcome that and be labeled as successful employees might make up an even smaller percentage. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a lot of data on the extent or rate at which these tests do reject autistic or neurodivergent individuals relative to neurotypical individuals. Um, probably because most companies aren't tracking or releasing that data. But I would be very eager to hear if anyone's had experiences taking these tests. Um, I would really love to hear what that was like and whether you feel that the tests were um, a generally helpful part of the hiring process or whether there were barriers associated with the tests. Um, I think one other barrier with the test is just that surveys in general can often be challenging for autistic people to answer. And we may often be perceived by the test or by the algorithm as having inconsistent results due to answering questions literally or um, answering variations of a similar question differently because of the nuances and phrasing. So 
if anyone has first-hand experiences or I guess just any thoughts in this video in general, um, I'd be very interested to hear that. Um, thank you very much for watching and take good care.